Hello, and welcome to another Fire 4 Developers tutorial video. Uh, my name is Gino Canessa, and we're here in part four of going through a smart app launch workflow uh, with a C -sharp .NET Core application uh, with a local web server. So uh, the other parts are linked here and GitHub repos there. So uh, as usual, there's a lot of content. Let's jump right in. So we're picking up, uh, in case you're picking up from uh, out of order, uh, where we are right now is we have a .NET Core program, uh, command line interface program, that we can use and it will connect to the fire, a fire server and get the authorize and token URLs and it will launch a web server in the background uh, and on a random port. So it will go through and uh, ask for what that port is and then we can pick up so that we know what port it is and we're just letting the program run for another 30 seconds or so. so. We're running this web server in the background so it won't keep our program open, uh, but then we don't have any other content yet because we don't have anything else to do in the program. So we're just sleeping here a little at the end. So if we continue through the workflow, the next thing we really need to do is do this redirect to the auth server. So we're going to go look right here and we can see when it asks for the authorization we have to create this URL with the parameters we need. And so some of these are fixed and some of these are variable. And oh there you go there's an example here. So for instance here we can see we want to go to authorize and then response type is code and again that's fixed up here. There's a few that are fixed. Uh, client ID, you know, whatever that's going to be. The redirect URI, and so now we can see first that these are URL encoded parts, and so this is going to be our pointer back to our localhost web server. Uh, launch, and up here we can see these are all described here. Oh, there's a launch parameter because this is uh, talking about the EHR launch. We're not going to be using that parameter. Uh, the scopes that we're asking for, some state information, and then the audience. So uh, the audience is kind of the, uh, there you go, you can see it's the fire, U fire server URL. And so that's kind of the way of ensuring that, yes, this is where we intend to use it. So that's the audience on the token. Uh, state, this will be useful as we get more, uh, more uh, functionality into our program, uh, because then we'll be able to keep track of where things were. And then scopes, you can see there's a link here to further details talking about what the different scopes are. So just, we did a video on this before, but just really quickly so we're all on the same page. There's a few different categories of things, uh, and you can see they're kind of broken up here. So for instance, and I'm going to jump around a little bit just because it makes more sense. Uh, you can see like launch alone is permission to obtain the launch context when it's launched from the EHR. So we're saying that in an EHR launch, uh, I want my app to be able to figure out what we were doing in the EHR. And then there's a specific one for, for instance, launch patient. So this is what we're going to be using, is saying if we're launching from outside the EHR, can, we can ask for a patient to be selected. Uh, and that way we have a single patient, even though we might be running in a provider context that we want uh, multiple, uh, the accounts will have access to multiple patients, we want them to pick just one. Um, these, this group here, OpenID, Fire User, or OpenID Profile, these are the current logged in user information. So be able to grab the user ID, if they put the username, user email, whatever, those things will be there. And then, uh, oh, I'll do these first, uh, the online access and offline access. So these two here. Uh, these are just about how tokens work and what you can do with refresh tokens or not. So the two remaining ones are these patient, re, uh, patient and user prefixed ones. And these are the ones that actually give you access to things. So in this case, what we're saying is we want access to things in the user context or if we want things in a patient context. So remember before we were talking about that a little here. Um, the user might be a physician who has access to 100 patients. Um, 
And so if you said user slash, and then we'll say like patient, because these are resource uh, name dot uh, operations. So if we said user slash patient dot read, then we would be saying, I want permission to read every patient this user has access to. Whereas if we said patient slash patient dot read, then we're saying, I want access to this patient's record. So you can see that it's a pretty straightforward syntax. Uh, and I think there's more, there you go. Uh, there's a better definition down here in EBNF. Um, but you can see that it's patient or user, the slash, either a fire resource, or you can do star for everything. And then you do dot, read, write, or star. So there's examples here on this page. Again, if you need more info, I definitely recommend reading it. But you can see we want to read all the observations on a patient. We want to read the demographics about a patient. Uh, and then similar things for user level scopes. So we can say, you know, for instance, managing appointments uh, and things like that. You can see that there would be some good use cases for each. Uh, and that's why they both exist. So uh, we'll go through with a pretty standard set here. But uh, we can pay attention here to see that these are also URL encoded, and then these are separated with pluses. Uh, so we can see it's launch plus patient observation read, patient observe, you know, uh, but you can see that the slashes have been converted to percent %2f. So we want to make sure that we're URL encoding these things. Uh, interestingly, this one has not been. So we'll probably want to, I'll actually uh, mention that on here to see uh, which way is the right way. Uh, probably it'll work either way uh, because the underlying layers will either URL encode or not and then decode or not, but uh, we'll want to try it both ways and make sure. So that's there's always little questions like this in the spec, uh, and I'll go ahead and uh, raise that one with the uh, documentation here so that we can make sure that's clarified. Perfect. So the next thing we really want to do here, uh, just to try first, is uh, launching a URL. So in theory, from .NET Core, we can just do process.start and give it a URL. Uh, and we don't have, what is it? Uh, using, uh, I can never remember which one that's in. Usually I let it guide me. Uh, what is it? Using, sys using system.runtime.drop services, I think it is. Or is it uh, system diagnostics that has that? One of those two will have it. There we go, system diagnostics has it. We'll leave the interop services because we know we're gonna need that later. So theoretically here, we can just give it a URL. So uh, in here, we'll just try it once and see what happens. Uh, and in case you can't tell by all this foreshadowing, uh, it's not actually going to work. Excuse me. So the reason being, and we need to let all this other stuff run through, and it's going to catch an exception saying that it couldn't find the file specified. So uh, I'd like to go through this exercise here just so that we're doing everything, uh, everything the right way. But if we come here and say .NET Core launch URL process start, for instance, uh, we can see that there's a few things. Um, and in part, we can see there's some stack overflow, there's some GitHub. Uh, and in this case, we can see this is GitHub from the .NET runtime. And we can see that there's an issue here specifically. Uh, and that looks very similar to what we're saying, cannot find the file specified. Uh, it's a pretty long one, so in these I like to jump down to the bottom and kind of see. Uh, and it looks like, yeah, it looks like what we need to do is do this. So we need to give it process start info and everything else. Now, I'll note that here it's talking about other programs that we might want to open um, on different platforms. And so this looks like it works very well on Windows and maybe works on other platforms. Uh, and we can actually try that out here in a minute. 
and then if not, we might have to put in some OS platform specific stuff to see what works. So this is pretty straightforward. You can see it's just a process start info, and then we're going to give it the file name, and we need to tell it use shell execute true. That's what this issue is actually about. So we'll go ahead and add that. So what we want to do is process start info, start info, and you know what? Let's move this into a function too. We'll go ahead and do that because we're, we're going to be launching URLs. That feels like something we're going to need to do uh, relatively regularly. And so we'll just give it a void and say um, launch URL. And we need to give it the URL to launch. And now we can put all this back here a little bit. Perfect. So we want to do a new process start info. And again, we wanted to give it file name was the URL. And then we wanted to tell it to use shell execute equals true. And so this is just the way that it uh, handles things. Um, the shell execute is, uh, if you don't know, in Windows, there's the Windows shell that does a lot of the redirections and things like that. So when you have this set to false, it can go and run that application directly. But in this case, there's nothing to resolve a URL. So the URL doesn't have anything. And the shell is the one that has things like uh, protocol handlers and things like that uh, resolution in there. So uh, I think what we do actually want to do is do change this back to a bool. Uh, and then we want to do things like put this in a try block so we can see because that's a little bit better practice here. Um, and we can just oops, catch an exception and we don't actually care about what the exception is. Uh, we just know it failed. Anytime it fails, we want to do something else. Uh, and in this case, we're just going to, need to say uh, fail to launch URL and return false. And then here we can return true uh, because it started it. So if we document this, oops, launch a URL in the user's default web browser. Uh, and we want to say true if successful and go from there. Uh, false otherwise. So we now have a way of launching a URL. And so we'll try that here as we'll just do launch URL and launch github.com. And so now if all goes according to plan, when this runs, since we're on Windows, failed to launch URL. System Command Model Win32. Let's see, what did we do? I think I know what we did already. Yep, we still had the uh, thing hard coded here. So we need to actually use the process start that we made and try that again. And perfect. So I can see here it launched a new GitHub.com. Okay, so. Uh, what we want to do then is say we're not sure if this is going to work in other operating systems and uh, I do have WS2 or WSL installed here with Ubuntu uh, but it's not going to be able to launch a web browser because I don't have the uh, X server and everything else running. So uh, I don't really see any problem with adding something like this uh, so that we can have some more options. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and do that, but we're going to make one more change because there's uh, something higher up uh, that's worth noting. So uh, in here, what we can just do is add a private, oops, private static bool uh, launch URL Linux, for instance. Uh, and then what we'll do is if this fails, then what we want to do is, and we can't really put a try. So fail to launch, failed, 
first attempt to launch URL. And what we really want to do is something like here and put a bool that says launched. And we're going to start that with false. Uh, and if we're here and haven't had an issue, then we'll say launched equals true. Uh, and then what we can do is put in this OS platform stuff. Now we don't really have anything, any other way of attempting it on Windows right now. Uh, and actually that's not entirely true. We do actually have something else. So let's add that. Uh, runtime information dot is OS platform, OS platform dot windows. Oops. And then we can do else if and else if. Uh, and we could also just do a switch here for switch runtime information uh, dot OS platform. Yeah, there, there's a way to do it with a switch, but uh, these, in, these can entail multiple platforms. And so it's uh, a little bit easier to just do it this way. So uh, what we want to do here is say something like, we only want to do this if we're not launched. So here we can say if launched, uh, we can go ahead and uh, return true. Return true. Uh, and then we'll only fall through here if we need to. So what we want to do is actually change, if, and where I was saying there's a little more, as we can see if we scroll up here, uh, the XDG is only on some platforms. There we go. Uh, we have this uh, XDG open, GNOME open, or KFM client open. So, oops, wrong window. So what we really want to do is do that. And so we'll come through here and add these. Um, we could even add them here. Yeah, we'll just do it all in the one function and be done with it. So we'll add this allowed programs to run. Uh, that'll be a little less clutter. It's only a few extra lines of code, so we won't worry too much. Uh, so what we want to do is uh, for each string, uh, we'll call it a helper in allowed programs to run. And we want to try and start the process with the helper. And same thing, we're going to have to put this in a try block. And then we'll catch an exception. And we don't really care about the exception here. But really what we're going to do is say, if this works, then we're going to say launched equals true. And we're going to break out of our for each. And uh, we'll just put a comment here so that we know we can just ignore. So that seems pretty useful here. Uh, and then we'll probably put this in a try block too. So we can say try to open. And then if it doesn't, same thing, we're just going to ignore the exception because we, we already have far more error handling than we probably need in a demo. But uh, again, uh, I like this. And actually, once it's launched, we don't even have to do any of this. We can just say return true. And that way we can do the same thing here. Uh, return true. Uh, and maybe we even want to just put that here. Instead of saying launch, we just say return true because we know that it launched if we're still there. And then we can get rid of this variable altogether. Perfect. So what we're missing is uh, this. And uh, same thing, this is just uh, an arcane syntax uh, to look up. And I've already looked it up, so I'm just going to grab it from here. Uh, I have it in another window saved. Uh, and you can just, uh, same thing, search through those threads that we were looking at here. And so what this is doing is just saying, okay, we're going to, uh, instead of trying to launch the URL directly, we're going to launch a command uh, prompt that will go ahead and start that URL. So this is kind of the same wrapper that should cause use shell execute, uh, but in case for whatever reason this failed or the behavior changed, this should always still work. Uh, so we just need to do the same thing here and wrap this guy in a try block. Oops. And catch 
any exception because we don't care and be done with it. So maybe what we really want to do is ignore here because it's just the first one failed. Uh, and then here we're just going to say failed to launch URL and return false. So that way we're saying uh, if we ever catch an exception, we're going to tell, tell the uh, user we failed and then exit out of this function. So I like that model better. So we'll do the same thing here. Uh, and actually, well, we could just ignore it at this point, actually. That's even better. Um, if we want to see the details of the exceptions, we can always add them later. Uh, but then down here, what we're going to do is say we fail to launch the URL and false. So, uh, I don't know why that is completely wrong there. So this is a much longer function to do it when really all we should need is a one-liner. But this is going to be much more reliable across everything. And it's the kind of thing I wanted to go through. You can see you write it once. Uh, and then in your next project, when you need it, you just go and copy the function and bring it forward. So uh, that's why I made it a little more robust than uh, other things we're doing here. So uh, in this case, now we can launch and we know that it works and it looks like it will work on many platforms, you know, a variety of Linux uh, flavors, OSX. We have specific handling for any of these. Uh, we don't have anything for cross building onto uh, mobile platforms or anything like that yet, but again, uh, can add those things if we need to. So, uh, if we come back over here and look, we're done with this, we're done with this. We are back here in our smart app launch. We need to build this URL. Uh, and that's what we want to launch. So, I'm going to go ahead and just put it here for a second so we can see and then comment it out. So what does this URL really look like? So string uh, URL and it looks pretty straightforward in some of these things. And we'll just do this here so that it's a little easier. Uh, the first thing is going to be the authorized URL. So that's very straightforward because we have the authorized URL already. Now, after that, we're going to start adding these parameters. Now, some of these were fixed, and some of them keep getting the wrong editor. Uh, so, we're going to add the ones that we know. Uh, we already know that uh, we're going to do uh, response type equals code, right? So, I actually like to style mine this way uh, response type equals code. Uh, and then we're going to keep going and say client app ID. Now again, if we're doing this on a real fire server, we're going to need to have a pre-registered app ID and everything else. Uh, since we're using the launcher right now, we don't really care. Uh, so we're going to do fire demo ID. That seems fair. Uh, and then now the redirect URI. Okay, so this is where we start getting interesting. So here, we're going to need the redirect URI, and we're going to have to actually build something here. Uh, and this is going to be the based on the listen port that we had here. So we could try and build it dynamically, and we don't actually need to. We can just do HTTP colon slash slash 127.001 colon listen port. Uh, so that's going to be our redirect URI. So that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the next one is the launch parameter. That's for EHR launch. We're not interested in that. Uh, and then some scopes. So again, right now, we'll just go ahead and hard code some scopes. Uh, and these are URL encoded in the example here. So let's go ahead and URL encode. And that's in HTTP utility, I want to say. Uh, let's see. System using system web. Uh, URL encode, uh, got that, and we're just going to put our string here with our scopes. So the scopes we want are what? Uh, we want launch patient, well, 
let's do the, the these prefix ones first. We want open ID, we want fire user and profile since we don't know which ones we want from our particular server. So again, these were listed up here. You can see, oops, uh, this window that we had open ID and fire user or open ID and profile. So uh, we'll go ahead and just ask for all three and uh, the server will just ignore the ones that it can't give us. Uh, we definitely want the launch patient. So let's go ahead and add that one. Uh, and then we have that piece. Uh, and then what else do we want? I think we'll want a refresh token. Uh, we won't worry about the refresh token yet. We'll grab that here in a little bit. Um, and then we want some actual scopes. So right now all we've said is we want to get a patient, uh, have the EHR select one, but we haven't asked for any actual scopes. So let's go ahead and say uh, we want access to patient slash star dot read. We'll start with that. So we'll say anything that's in this patient's uh, uh, compartment or things like that. And so any observations the patient has, the patient demographics themselves, uh, medications, conditions, whatever this patient should have, we're gonna ask for access to read that. Perfect. So we have those quotes and this all looks right. So then what else are we missing? We have scopes. We do have to pass some sort of state through, uh, and we don't really care about uh, the state right now because we're not uh, tracking anything in particular, but we'll just say local state just so we can see that it passes something through. Uh, and then we do need the audience. And the audience was just the fire URL that we started with. So that's this guy, fire server URL. So, uh, odd equals and this and now in this case it was not URL encoded so and actually I think this other one was yeah the redirect URI was so let's go ahead and we'll try and follow along as closely as we can uh, to the example and we're going to put all this it looks a little odd uh, because what we're gonna do is end quote for that URL encode, and then end that, and then end quote. Perfect. So now, when we go and launch this, we should start the OAuth workflow, and we should get back to our local server. Let's see what happens. First, let's make sure it all compiles, builds, runs. Perfect. It's launching a new thing, so we're saying we want to get everything else. Patient plus patient data. Those look a little odd, but we did go through everything. So we can see here we came to our local server and we got this. Uh, we'll just go ahead and copy the whole thing out uh, so that we can work with it a little easier. Uh, we can kill it because remember right now we just have our program running for 30 seconds after we're done. So we can see we do have uh, this code and if you're not familiar this is a JWT, a JWT. So what we can do is actually grab everything that's in the code uh, and we're not supposed to be able to do this. This is just because we're using the launcher. This, this code is opaque. Uh, but you can see that this thing is, a, a, I believe it's a jot at least. Uh, so if we go to jwt.io, we should be able to, for instance, paste the encoded one. Yep. And we can see that it's an HS256 uh, uh, there. And we can see that they, it's passing through all these other things. Now, I don't like that this is this way. I think that that's actually incorrect because that's not uh, the way I've normally seen it. So let's let's try something here to see. Uh, what if we change these to pluses? 
or to spaces because that is this normal syntax that I'm used to. And again, if that's the case, I will make sure. Oh, because it's URL encoded. Okay, so it was just changing those for us. Yep, so this is working better. So now it's asking us to do the practitioner login like we expect, pick a patient like we expect. Uh, it's asking for all this other information, and then it's giving us a new one of these. So we can close our other one and yep, we can just kill this, paste it, and uh, it's just the URL encoding that was throwing me off. So that's why those are, those end up pluses don't start as pluses. And do, 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 there we go. Oops, I miss, miss click here. I want from here to here. So if we do that, now we can come back here and paste this guy in. There we go. And you can see this is what I expected to see. Uh, we have our context. We do have a patient ID. Uh, we have client ID being returned in here, user, scope, everything else. Now again, we can only see this because we're using the Smart App Launcher. Whatever code it actually gives us is opaque. So it's, there's no guarantee that it's a job. There's no guarantee that it's anything. It could just give us a GUID, uh, but the server that's running this passes everything so it can be stateless. But it's nice to be able to see that we are doing things correctly. So again, good debugging tool, but make sure that you don't depend on this being here. All right, so uh, now that we are calling back this URL in the web browser, we need to actually pull out this code and we can go ahead and grab the state too. So if we remember right now, we just have in startup, uh, this is what's actually running in the web server. And all we're doing is this map get here. So uh, we can actually do this pretty straightforward here. Uh, and what happens is we have, and we can use var first so that you can see, but we can grab the context dot request dot, it's not gonna let us. Well, we can do an iQuery collection query equals context dot. There we go, the autocomplete's coming back. Uh, I happen to know what we were looking for. Request dot query. So in this case, what we're doing is just grabbing the query collection for the query. Um, and uh, we're just gonna iterate over this and we're actually gonna need to use this extensions primitives. Uh, so that we can grab this. And so we want to do a for each and it's something like I enumerable, oh no, uh, sorry, it's a key value pair string and it's a string, oh, what's the name of it? It's a string values, there we go. Uh, so it's a string values kvp equal uh, for each in Query. So if you look up the documentation for this request.query, that's all this query collection is. It's just a, an interface over the parsed uh, string and then key value pair, the string values. And the reason they do this is if you uh, give, for instance, in this case, if it returned code equals one and code equals two, it would want to t be able to tell you that you have one code, uh, but you have two values for it. In our case, we're always just gonna care about the first, so we'll just use a link uh, as before to grab that. So the two pieces we need are actually just the code, and we'll initialize that to empty, and the state. So it's pretty straightforward here. All we need to do is uh, handle the ones we want, and we can do this in switch. Uh, in case we get more later, uh, just so that we're not uh, chaining ifs so much. But we want to go on the key of the key value pair and do a case for code. And we're gonna do a case for state because those are the two variables that it's gonna give us. And really we're just going to grab them. So what we want is kvp.value.value uh, first of default. 
So that way, uh, if for whatever reason this gives a null, uh, we won't break here because this is in the HTTP handler. And so we want to make sure things here don't, uh, do, don't break. So we'll just do the exact same thing here and grab the value. Um, we'll need somewhere to put it, so we'll do that in a second. But here we can say something like uh, code received. Oops. Uh, you may close this window. Uh, and we could go ahead and make this nicer and put in JavaScript that would close it for us, uh, or at least prompt to close it. Uh, but for now, I think for our demo, uh, again, being wary of time, we don't need to go quite that far. So over here in our program, we're going to need to grab those. So we'll make a call to say set off code and it'll take the code and the state and again we're just going to keep passing them through because uh, we don't need the state but it is mandatory here and then we want to make a habit of keeping track of it so that if we do need it uh, we're not uh, sh uh, shorting ourselves code that we're going to need later. Uh, in this case uh, we'll probably actually want to set these in some static variables just for convenience for right now. Uh, so we're going to do something like private static string uh, off code. And we'll start with string.empty and private static string um, <clears throat> client state equals string.empty. Uh, and again, uh, I'm a big fan of just putting things simply first, and then as we build them up, uh, end up uh, moving things into classes and refactoring. So long term, we probably wouldn't keep these here, but uh, it should be able to get us going. Uh, so here, we can just do a simple uh, off code equals code and client state equals state. Oops. State. Uh, and then same thing we want to tell the users. Uh, code received uh, and for now that'll be fine because the code's pretty eh, we can put the code in here uh, and we can just put in code so uh, in here we're actually what we're going to do long term is kick off the next step of the auth workflow so again if we go back to our chart that shows what we're going to do once we have this code, we're going to have to go and do an HTTP post. But this is just going to the token URL, so this is going to be internal to the application. We're not going to be showing anything else to the user at this point. Uh, and then we'll be able to use all of this. So, and state. So, we should actually just be able to run this. And if all goes according to plan, we see here we have our login page. We're selecting a patient for context because we asked for one. We say approve. And then we see here code received. You may close this window. So if we close the window, we come here and we see nothing because we never actually called that function. Uh, and that's always a, a thing you want to do is call the functions that you write. Uh, so we'll pass it the code and the state. So let's try that again. And we'll go through all this relatively quickly. We can see we have the login. We select a patient for context. It tells us what we want. We close our window. And perfect. Now we have code received, and we can see our code. So that is pretty straightforward now. And again, like I said, we would want something to automatically close this or anything like that. Uh, note, you know, you could try to stop the process and different things like that, uh, but really you just want to ask to close the window from inside generally. Uh, because this window might, you know, in the case we're running it here, you can see it's adding a new tab 
to uh, an existing window. So we don't really have control over how that is. That's going to be up to the user because in this case, we're just doing a desktop app and using their web browser preferences. So we don't have control over if it's a new window or not, what the name of the program is or not, uh, but that's all fine in this context. All right, so we're gonna want to use this code here. And you can see we need to now just do an HTTP post uh, with this URL encoded data for a few of these parameters. So uh, this should be, again, fairly straightforward. Uh, what we can actually do is use this set off code function that we have already. Um, we want to be aware we're calling it from program right now. So we definitely want to do something like task run uh, this uh, because we want to start it and not worry about coming back uh, and holding up the web processor. So we're here. We do need to change a couple of things, a, quick, a couple of quick refactorings. Uh, the first one here is that we need to make some of these things uh, accessible from down here. So uh, the first thing we'll do is move our client ID, and that's just going to be a constant string that we can use uh, because we're going to need that in the next section. So we definitely need that. And then we are going to need this listen, the redirect URI. So uh, we can go ahead and add that to private static string redirect URL. And we'll use that. And we'll want to set that uh, down here once we have our listen port. So redirect URL is uh, one, oops, HTTP 127.0.0.1 colon listen port. And then we'll want to make sure we're using it exactly as we are here. There we go. That cleans that up a little bit. So that looks like everything we're going to need. This is a fixed value. This is the code that we just got back. Uh, this is the redirect URI and this is the client ID. Perfect. So uh, down here we have everything. So we can just go ahead and put it in this function for now. And again, we can uh, do more with it later. Uh, but what we're going to want to do is do an HTTP request message. Uh, request. And it's going to start yelling at us because we haven't added systemnet HTTP. But that's easily fixed. So uh, the first thing is we know that this is a, uh, and then what's the HTTP request method is HTTP method, oops, dot post. So we know we're going to post. Um, we do know the URI, oops, we don't know the URI yet because we still need this token URL. So we missed that one. So private static string token URL. And again, we would want to uh, obviously be commenting these more and uh, making sure that we're checking for some of these things and everything else. But we need to set this here. Uh, and so now we can say the, um, let's see, the request URI is a new URI to that token URL that we did. Uh, and then we need to pass in uh, these things in U, uh, URL encoded form. So the easiest way to actually do that is just to make a dictionary. And apparently we never added system collections generic here. So we'll go back and add that. And we just want a dictionary of string string, uh, and we'll call this request values. And we can go ahead and add everything directly here. So this will have this, 
and that for now. So we know there's four things. The first one is this grant type, and it's fixed at authorization code. That's just listed here. We need the code, which is the code we got from the server. Oops, this one goes here. So we're gonna go ahead and use the code. Uh, the redirect URI is the same URI that we used in the beginning. So that is our, that was one of the ones we just moved. And then the client ID, and again, that's another, oops, keep doing that. Uh, that's one that we made a constant for because it's a fixed value here. So now that we have our dictionary, uh, we can say content equals new uh, form URL encoded content. So you can see this is the same form URL encoded content. Uh, and then we can actually just pass it the request values dictionary. Perfect. Uh, we don't have an HTTP client anywhere yet, so we can just go ahead and create one here. Uh, because I don't know that we're going to need it anywhere else. And if we do, we can always refactor this later. Uh, so we'll just create a new HTTP client. Uh, and then what we actually want is an HTTP response message. And we'll do client.send async our request dot result. And we can just as easily await. There we go. Oh, we can't. Oh, we never made this async. There we go. So now we have our response. Um, so we have a couple of things. So first off, let's say we want to check to see if this actually worked. And there's an easy one to see if this is a response code. So what we're, we'll do is actually just check to see if it failed. Uh, and then here we'll go ahead and say, Failed to get token, uh, yeah, failed to exchange code for token. And then we'll want to throw something. Uh, unauthorized. Unauthorized. And uh, we can actually put, uh, oops string interpolation uh, and then we can do something like response dot status code uh, just so we can see uh, and even response and we'll just do that perfect so now we know if we're here we had a successful response so uh, let's do string json because that's remember it's going to return this in json so we just want to get our response dot content and it's not that big we can just read it as a string and we can put another await here uh, and then for now let's just check to see if this works um, we'll say token and then we can put in our json so let's see what happens when we run this, we should get up, uh, get a launch request here. We get our login. We pick a patient. It's going to confirm that we know what we're doing. It says code received. We can close this window. Oh, outstanding. And we can see here we received our initial code. And now we have this token, which is this JSON uh, data here. And this is going to vary a little bit. Oh, let's see if we can grab the whole thing here. Let's stop so that we're not dealing with that. And it's kind of hard to read in this format, uh, but we can just go ahead and add it as a temp file. Uh, Token.json, just so we can see it. Uh, and then we can uh, beautify. I apparently don't have that installed on this one yet. So if we go ahead and add the beautify extension, 
then we can come here and beautify the file. Perfect. So we can see now we have a proper JSON token or a, a proper JSON response. And I named the token just uh, since that was the call we were in. Uh, but you can see we have need patient banner. We have a smart style URL. Uh, so that's where we can go to get the styling on uh, the EHR stuff if we want. We have a patient ID. So this is fantastic. Uh, we have the token type, which is a bearer. So that's going to tell us that this token is a bearer token. Uh, we have the scopes that we asked for and it granted us. Our client ID, which we knew and our expiration. So um, that is probably a good point to break. This one's gotten long already. Uh, but in the next segment, we'll go ahead and start using this and uh, get refresh tokens and all kinds of stuff like that. So again, I uh, hope this content is useful. Uh, if it is, please let me know. Uh, and if it isn't, please let me know what would be. Uh, thanks again and see you in the next session.